Uh, uh, was, both, was the Pope appealing for peace or was he praying for peace? Um, and, and the same applies to the carry on dragon. Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you, what do you have to say about that guy? Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Views on the News. Yes, I'm sorry, I still haven't revised the intro. <laughs> that was the original intro when we called it Global Atheist News Review. i do it one day. I'm busy. Leave me alone. <laughs> anyway, we have an excellent panel with us tonight. We have uh, an irregular member, but a, a person who's been with us for sometime dread higgs from british columbia pirate higgs welcome dread how are you yeah yeah we have a new boy bryce cornell who is uh, i believe in philadelphia i am right now so i apologize about yeah. the shoddy uh wi-fi connection if i go in and out you're, you're all loud and clear at the moment thank you welcome thank you we have a regular dr Yo. ty wells from tennessee Welcome, Ty. Yo, and, peace. Love it. And we have John. John Peters from Oregon. Welcome, John. Hello. Hey, John. So, hey, John. Here we go. Here we, when I can find my, my script, and we'll, we'll go. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, yeah. So the news this week has been a mixture. We have this interesting story from the Vatican, where there is a case going on, Italian investigators are looking into a charity linked to Cardinal Becciu. I think I'm saying it right. Back in 2014, he purchased and later sold a London real estate property. And the result of that was the Vatican lost millions of euros. So there's now a trial over it. And at a session of the Vatican's corruption trial on Thursday, March the 9th, a couple of days ago, the Vatican's chief prosecutor, Alessandro Didi, presented the court with an extraordinary exchange of letters between Pope Francis and this Cardinal Angelo Becciu, who's one of the trial's 10 defendants, in which the Cardinal pleaded with the pontiff to back his version of events and drop the charges of financial malfeasance against him. Mm. <laughs> he, apparently, th there's a telephone recording that was made without the Pope's knowledge or consent. And in, in a letter dated uh, July 24th, 2021, Becciu thanked the Pope for his telephone call and once again asked the Pope to confirm his authorization. He's trying to pass the buck. He wants to say it was the Pope who, what done it, not me. Right. He ends up with a threat. He said, I should cite you, Pope, as a witness in the trial, but I would not allow myself to do so. That's a veiled threat, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think of that, guys? Well, it just goes to show the it never stops, right? They just they can't help themselves but to indulge in their corruptions and and their yeah, it's just it's ridiculous. It's not a problem because they can always pray for forgiveness. I don't see what your issue with this dread is. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean it's it you know it's like it's amazing. The, when they, it's like when the boat came over to Canada to apologize or you know, to apologize or when the natives went over to there to to hear the Pope's apology. He doesn't. He doesn't care. He's just doing it for face. And, and deep down, you know, the church is the church, and they'll just do whatever the hell they please, right? Don't you love the it buck? Makes me wonder. Do Go these ahead. people actually believe what it is that they're preaching? I mean, is it just <laughs> for? Is it just for show? Is it just for the Catholics to keep giving them money, or do they actually believe that you know? It, lying is a sin that corruption stealing is a sin like they don't seem to be acting like it you know Woo, that's very suspicious price 
Anyone else want to come in on that? Nope. Okay. Right. I'll move on to the next item then. A year 10 student at Kettlethorpe High School in Wakefield, Yorkshire, brought a slightly damaged Quran that he'd borrowed from the school back to school. And he brought it back reportedly, I think it was borrowed from the school, but he brought it into the school reportedly as part of a dare. The cover of the Islamic text was slightly torn and some part pages were marked. The boy's mother said he's 14 and has high functioning autism. But since then, he's received death threats for bringing in this holy book in such a poor condition. Now, that the death threats have been deemed uh, by the education minister of the Okay, UK. I was As worried. I, I thought the death threats came from the librarian for coming in late. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the, the death threats come from another child at the school um, and, and another 14-year-old. And the our education minister, the UK's education minister, says this is totally unacceptable. I have deep concern, she says, and four students have been suspended. And what do you think about that? Was one of them the person who issued the death threats? I hope so. <laughs> we we have no more detail. Yeah, I'm me afraid. too. <laughs> well, it'd be interesting to get yeah. what the parents. I, mean, I think that something. That, but... Yeah, Bryce, right? you, you you go know, ahead. the parent of the kid who issued a death threat is like. You know, if they're if they're behind it, you know, then uh, well, they're as culpable certainly for uh, teaching the child to behave in that manner, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Um, yeah. That to me calls for in, in this country we have parent teacher conferences or whatever. Like oh. that would necessitate a three way conversation between the, the staff, the parents, and the student to figure out where this comes from because that kid might yeah. potentially be a real threat. Yeah, mm, absolutely. And Nobody I, seems to be very surprised, I noticed. I, I think the bigger issue nope. is what do we do with um, Islam's uh, attitude towards the Quran, that it's holy, that you can't uh, criticize it, you can't make fun of it, you can't draw anything with Muhammad, um, mm. you know, all these blasphemy laws, which are killing people around the world. Um, yeah. You know, other than letting Islam catch up to Christianity since it's 600 years behind, you know, mm -hmm. how many people have to die in generations before they finally figure out that this is not a good way to, to conduct a society. And I don't have any answers. I don't, I don't know how you go about um, fertilizing the moderate Muslims out there that can start pushing back against the fundamentalists, but it's, it's a terrible problem from throwing gays out windows to, yeah. um, you know, going after apostates with death penalties. If you don't believe, let alone marking or doing anything that looks like you're desecrating the Quran. And, and I know it's been used in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan and other, other countries to for a neighbors to go after um, their other neighbors who they don't like, they'll just have to say, "Is that oh, I heard this person say something yeah, bad," or yeah. or they they stepped on a Quran at behind yeah. the house. I saw that. And let's go kill them. And I, I don't know. I don't have any answers. Does anybody else know how to stop this craziness? Yeah, it's the same old witch hunt stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. wanted to bring up a couple of things. One, um, death threats are not protected speech in in our country and like there's always the argument of freedom of speech true but there's the limitations that come with yeah. that yeah. and that also applies to intended threats of harm against people and mm. so when someone is freely saying hey there's a death threat and and the response is oh it's okay because it's cultural or it means a lot to them it's like no there's no excuse to make that kind of a statement to another no. person with intended harm that should be one of the things that should be fundamentally and resolutely condemned. Yes, yeah, it's disproportionate, isn't it? Hurting right. a book on the one hand and killing a human on the other. And exactly. what puzzles me is they're treating the book as if it's an, a precious icon. And surely, right. is, isn't there religion against that? 
Like, it has to so. be in somewhere, right? Like when you're pressing the book, when you're making a label into the book, like if there's a machine that's being like, chung, 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 is it like slowing down because it's the Quran? It's like, I, I'm, <laughs> if you're, making, you're giving me a hard job here. It's just aluminum foil. You, you, you know? Yeah, you don't want to cause traumas with the Quran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to be easy on that robot a little bit. I can't speak for Muslims, but I imagine they see it in the same way that Catholics view the uh, eating of the bread, literally the transfiguration becoming the body of Christ and the wine Ooh. becoming the blood of Christ. So for, yeah. that, for them, it may be a situation where once the words are on paper, it's literally the word of God. And so they kind of view it in the same way. You know, they have similar restrictions on drawing the prophet, right? You're not allowed yes. to draw the prophet because any attempt to represent the prophet becomes basically the prophet so yeah um yeah. now i cannot say that's for sure but that seems to be how they are approaching it and that is unreasonable by our standards but this is they're not the only religion that does that you know no they're the yeah. only re religion that we know of that responds as extreme as they do to people who violate yeah. that but they seem to view it in a similar way right it's more, and, it's, it's more than unreasonable it's downright weird in my mind it's also sort of the loaded. Well, I think the punishments. Oh, sorry. sorry, I was just saying it's sort of a loaded experiment too, where the harm that comes from damaging the Bible or the Quran comes from other Muslims who are angry that you damaged yeah. the, the Quran. It's not a. Can we do a test where we just fundamentally see if if Allah is actually upset when we do this, and we'll have a group, you know, de destroy or damage some Bibles, and a group that doesn't, we just see what happens. It's the it's a group actively making a, a, a circumstance happen. And as a result, we know who's to blame. And I feel <laughs> honestly, it would be the equivalent of, I think you can get a bunch of Catholics, separate them in half and be like, you're going to eat the body of Jesus by only eating carbohydrates. And you guys can eat protein and you're going to work out. And we're going to see who builds better protein mass. But you can only eat the blood and the body of Jesus. <laughs> eating crackers. Let's see who gets better pecs by the end of like a four week period. I think we could do that test without as much harm coming about, but I don't know yeah. if Muslims would be as open to their own. And, and then you could have pastafarians as the control group, right? Yes. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I like that because not you could have the control group, the pastafarians, but then you'd have the Bible, the Quran, and maybe the Hindu Vedas or the Torah, and each of them would be beaten with a hammer or something, and you'd see which one begot the worst outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need Science to do these involved. experiments. It, actually, they, got, they, they should put people, they should, they should test this with people in an fMRI, right, to see what's going on in their yeah. brains. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe there's, uh, you know, some uh, some therapy or something that can help uh, mitigate the uh, the trauma that people suffer when they see their holy books uh, assaulted. Mm -hmm. I would say this: if God, I need didn't to want correct to myself also. Oh. oh, sorry. I was just going to say I needed to correct myself because a few moments ago I said transfiguration, but it's actually transubstantiation. It's, yes. Yeah, uh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We knew what yeah, you meant, so. right? Sure. Time. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick point. Like God could solve a lot of these problems if he just made every edition of the Quran indestructible. Yes. Right? So it, it would help. It's the same it, it, if you were having a Garden of Eve, you know, uh, I'm sorry, Garden of Eden, where you have an apple that's within reachable distance that's yeah. edible to human beings that have a teeth. You could have made that tree 10 feet taller and yes. solved a lot of problems. Yeah. I do like that no, idea. No, Ty, you're... I said I, you're, I like you're missing how, it because that, the whole point you, was for them to get it. I uh, know that's why so you can't blame us if that was the point. Like you can't put the blame on people. So like you can't put the blame on yeah. infidel for destroying the Quran if the Quran is capable of being destroyed. And if you don't yeah. want it to be destroyed, just make it indestructible. You're that's the creator right. of the entire universe. And then an indestructible holy book for an atheist would be an amazing tool to demonstrate that this is the right book. Well, like, that would you know, be sufficient evidence, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, would, it would be no blow my mind. because that would be the you know that would be the clear evidence that uh, the whole thing is true. Yeah, we, and, and, and a great way to sell bulletproof vests moving forward, right? John, you yeah. wanted to come in. Oh, I just I thought Ty's idea was great. Just to have it so that if anybody touches it with the wrong attitude, there's a big lightning bolt that comes out and fries yeah. it. Just yeah, so yeah. Or, or the face melt. I like the face melt yeah. and like 
the Raiders yeah. a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Guess I what? I stopped being an atheist yeah. that day, yeah. but I wouldn't worship that God, but I would yeah. stop being an atheist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It shouldn't be too to, difficult. I was, I was trying to come up with a movie or a story that has that. I'm sure there's something like that, that it, no matter – in fact, there, there was a movie – Gosh, it was a it was a space science fiction thing where they pulled this cylindrical thing out of space and they were trying to drill through it and and get in to find out what it was and, and no tools would ever break yeah. into it. So you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah. That, that, we had a television series like that. What was it called? Uh, the Quatermass Experiment. I don't oh, know that that's what you're thinking of, but it's our version over here in in Britain. Yeah. So speaking of Britain. No, not speaking of Britain. Not yet. We've just done Britain, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah, you so, did Wales or something, yeah. Uh, Yorkshire, South Yorkshire. So Yorkshire. Coming, out, coming out of Britain and coming over to your neck of the woods, you Americans, there's a guy called Rick Scarborough who <laughs> he describes himself, I'm going to have difficulty saying this, as a Christocrat. Oh, my gosh. This guy. All right. Yes. He, he's a strident anti-LGBTQ activist and a long-time critic of public education. And he's set his sights to take over public education in Texas. Yeah. He, he intends to do this by taking over the school boards and fear-mongering about public school students being groomed by homosexuals and trans perverts and recruited into their evil lifestyles. I've got a clip. You want to see this? What, oh, no, I don't. Go on ahead. Go on ahead. Go on ahead. Go on ahead. Uh, no. yeah, see it. I'm gonna make they went after me as, you know, trying to take over the town, uh, trying to take over America. And, well, honestly, I was. Uh, but I couldn't say that. I mean, why not take it over for Jesus? 68% of the teachers in Texas by poll I think it's 68, I wrote it down, now believe that the LGBTQ agenda should be taught and embraced. 68%. We're grooming our children for pedophiles. That's what's happening. Now, let me tell you what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. And by God's grace, if I can raise the budget and get people behind me, in four years... I want to. I want to get. I want to expunge this entire state of every immoral book in the library. Call me a Nazi. Call me a book burner. I've been called worse. You're a Nazi. <laughs> what? And a book burner. What, oh boy. What, what could possibly go wrong if you just want to innocently take over the schools for Jesus? Yeah, yeah, just want to make a point. This guy's from Texas. His last name is not Scarborough. It's Scarborough. Okay. <laughs> it's so unacceptable. Isn't it amazing that that where you're going to have problems with pedophiles are the youth pastors at summer camps and the yeah. Catholic priests? It's like yeah. the last person that's going to you know groom you and have a problem is going to be the LGBTQ. It's right. just yeah. gone. It's like how they can it's totally ignore the, the facts and the data is unbelievable. Oh, yeah. It's like every single time you point a finger, you got multiple pointing back at you. That's right. right. Yeah. 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 Did, you see the, did you see the uh, audience? Did you, did you take a peek at the audience? You know, when he was speaking, it's like, you know, they're all geriatricians and white folks. And here we go with the, uh, the elderly. The notes. Yeah. And, um, you know, so. Uh, but that's been their, that has been their agenda. Um, you know, I, I married into an evangelical fundamentalist family and the public schools were called government schools to my kids. Oh. And um, they uh, considered it uh, indoctrination and, you know, and the Amway uh, couples and, and Du Bois that got into um, the Department of Education, they are absolutely, they will, they want, the public uh, education in America completely, um, you know, the, the rug pulled out from under them. And if they can't do that, what they're doing is, is they're trying to deflect the tax money into yeah. vouchers. Yeah. And so it, it is an attack that has been yeah. going on since the 1930s in America on mm. public education. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Of course, over here, a public school is an independent school. We've managed to get the names backwards. And as it should happen, I'm speaking at one next Wednesday 
uh, debating a Christian on the subject of Is can we be without God? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Bryce, I think you wanted to say something, right? Well, I was just wondering what they think the LGBTQ agenda is. Like, did yes. they ever actually define that? I'm pretty sure eating babies is on the list, right? Or is that atheist? That's the atheist. Oh, think my bad. I, I think it's projection, right? So they want to convert. So they assume that everybody else wants to convert to their oh. ideology and stuff. And yeah. so, uh, you know, all you have to do in America is as oh. soon as a Republican starts talking about homosexuality, just wait a year and they're going to get outed almost every time. Yes. Yeah, so true, John. Yes. It's so good. You got to yeah. get ahead of the curve. You just need to have like an out and proud conservative who like is gay, but still self loathes mm. himself so much that he's yeah. still anti-gay. That way there's no like turnaround. Oh, he was gay the whole time? It was like, oh, he was already gay the whole time. Then then well, it all like sort of Who was it? Haggard? Was it a, a priest or, or a pastor who got outed? Very uh, anti. Was it Haggard? I forgot the name, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, so many. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The weird, the weird thing is, I just want to point this out. We're looking at an old bigot speaking to an audience. Mm. Mm. Uh, at one point in time, he was a young bigot, and the and the interesting thing is, you brought up a story about a kid who was bringing in a book and was getting a death threat from another student. Mm. Every single old person that managed to survive that had this sort of mindset mm. and bigotry started as a young person. We shouldn't be surprised Ooh. that there are young kids willing mm. to throw death threats out for uh, mm. facing the Quran, because though the old ones are the ones that just survived long enough which means yeah. that there's still work to be done in terms of getting young minds not being indoctrinated indoctrinated into that level of hate. Because if yeah. you can get to them early enough or save them from that early enough, you save them yeah. from having to maintain that until they get to their adulthood. And I would say, yeah. in a sad sense, I would say it's about their formative year, maybe, maybe 35, maybe like 15, it's gonna be different for every person. But like if they live with that hate, if they, in, if they use that as a way to determine how reality works, from a fundamental level, if that becomes a part of their identity and they speak out about it confidently to their peers and social networks with this level of like bombastic hatred, mm. it's going to be much harder for it to get rid of. But if you can get them ahead of time, be like, hey, by the way, these people have feelings too, and there is no such thing as like a gay agenda. Well, well that's why out. they want to destroy education. That's why they exactly. want to take education away from them. Because when you teach yeah. people, that's, you know, a lot of their expectations and assumptions, once they learn that that's wrong and what science actually mm. is and what the data says, mm. a lot of them change their mind. So how do you protect right. them from that? Yeah. You take away education. I, I and, much prefer changing the minds of the young to mm. culling everyone over 60. Right. <laughs> I can also say it's beneficial <laughs> for everyone because there's whether you're taught to hate gays or not doesn't affect your sexual orientation. And there might be people who are gay that get fed this hate and then turn it on to themselves. And that's yeah. really damaging. And when I was a kid, I never knew anything about asexuality. So I'm asexual. I didn't know about that until I was 30. I thought there was something wrong with me mm -hmm. until like my adult life. And I realized it's, it, there's a, there is a sensation called sexual attraction that I just don't understand because I've never truly experienced it. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's not a problem. Doesn't mean I hate women. Doesn't mean I, I have a low libido. It's just an orientation that you got. And if, mm. if I had that sat down, if a teacher just sat down and explained that to me one in one PowerPoint slide before moving on to the next thing in high school, you would yeah. have saved me a lot of trouble, a lot of relationships I tried to start, a whole bunch yeah. of drama. I yeah. feel like it could have been a lot more beneficial to just give me that information from the get-go. Yes, That's why I value education and sex education you, like this. You're just, you're just an early developer, you know, Ty, because everyone gets around to being asexual if they live long enough. <laughs> now, John, you keep bringing that up, but I'm going to tell you arousal is not the same thing as attraction. And I'm just making oh, okay. that. Yeah, that's true. So, like, you, there's, there's a distinction there. And the more you learn about stuff like that, the more jokes like that, you can accept them, but you can also understand that the education behind them isn't applicable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so valuable to understand, just a sense of identity. Another thing that we bring up on this show, just one last soapbox moment, is sometimes we'll say, uh, hey, I don't want, there's like a story about a person who's being gay that has to hide it. And it's like, you can't really hide being gay. It's an identity that you have. It's not like you're gay only when you're having sex with a partner of the same mm -hmm. uh, gender or, or the mm -hmm. same sex. 
gay is like a, a identification term and you're gay even when you're not pr participating in sex. And so if that's the case, we got to like make sure people are fully aware of like what it means to what an actual gay person is, what a, a, a sexual person is, what a bisexual person is. Understand that these are all commonplace terms for people that do exist, that have existed. And it's not a new way of coming to take away rights from straight people. It's in fact just a thing that's always been a thing. It's not scary. And the more that we educate ourselves on it, the less we can use them as a target to split people apart against our better interests. Hmm. Dredd has come on to the chat to say that his connection is a bit wonky. So that's why he suddenly disappeared from the panel. Poor guy. Never mind. Uh, we have another pope comes into the story this week. <clears throat> An old pope, a previous pope. I think he's dead now, St. John Paul II. And it's recently been revealed that he knew about the sexual abuse of children by priests when he, he was in Poland at the time and he was an archbishop, uh, but he kept it quiet and moved the priests around to different parishes or sent them to cloisters. This back in the 1970s, one was sent to Austria after they were all accused of abusing minors. And this is only coming out now because the Polish TV channel has dug it up and named the, the priests who have been, um, who, who have been, uh, who are being, uh, who are abusing. So this is former Archbishop Carol Wojtyla, who became John Paul II. Now, that's, that's not sort surprised of at all. Sorry? Yeah. Not surprised at all. No, nobody's surprised. I, I assumed that in the first place, to be honest. I didn't realize that was even breaking news. That was my initial assumption. Of course he would know about it. Do they? Th the buck stops with the Pope. Do they think that the archbishops and the cardinals below him were c conducting this mass conspiracy without his knowledge? It's ridiculous. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. There's, the new, reason it's news is because They've only just dug it up and publicized it. Right. Okay. Now, here's a really sad instance. This is uh, back in Texas. You'll, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> and it's, it's about five women who claim they were denied abortions oh. despite facing life-threatening health risks. And they're now suing the state over its abortion ban because... Texas bans abortions except for medical emergencies, but the doctors are reluctant to pronounce a medical emergency because mm -hmm. they face a punishment of up to, listen to this, 99 years in jail. Yeah. Yep. So, so watch this very sad video. Mm -hmm. Doctors explained to me how amniotic fluid is so important to the development of the baby's organs up until around 24 weeks, but that was more than a month away. And they said, even with the best neonatal intensive care, a fetus cannot survive outside the womb at 19 weeks. My heart broke into a million pieces. Excuse me. I didn't even know a pain like that could exist until that moment. My husband and I received the harrowing news that I had dilated prematurely due to a condition known as cervical insufficiency. Soon after, my membranes ruptured and we were told by multiple doctors that the loss of our daughter was an event. My healthcare team was anguished as they explained there was nothing they could do because of Texas's anti-abortion laws, the latest of which, by the way, had taken effect two days after my water broke. It meant that even though we would, with complete certainty, lose Willow, my doctor could not intervene as long as her heart was beating or until I was sick enough for the ethics board at the hospital to consider my life at risk and permit a standard health care I needed at that point, an abortion. I cannot adequately put into words the trauma and despair that comes with waiting to either lose your own life, your child's life, 
Bro. For days, I was locked in this bizarre and avoidable hell. The preventable harm inflicted on me will medically make it harder than it already was for me to get pregnant again. The barbaric restrictions our lawmakers have passed are having real life implications on real people. That's, it, it is heartbreaking, isn't it? These poor women denied medical care. It is, and um, Texas is harming their own people, you know, yes. with, with their, their law. They're certainly not there's certainly not, not pro life. Looks like I went out for a second, but the point I was making is that they were not pro life. They're no. they're just anti choice, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's sad they, 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 because they uh, well they execute so many people. I think they execute more people than any other state, Texas. So mm -hmm. they're clearly not pro life. <laughs> they're pro yeah. birth but they don't care about the lives. It's just, it's sad. And when I say they, no. I'm talking about the people making the laws, not the citizens who are the subject of these laws. Yeah, indeed. John. I see, as a physician, uh, Ty's a physician too, and I my medical school was actually in Texas. So, um, but the medical schools are bubbles, you know, compared to what the Republicans think. And so, um, there's going to be a lot of women hurt. There's going to be women dying. Yeah. Uh, this actually has been kind of going on in, under the table for a long time because um, pharmacists would sometimes not fill prescriptions because of deeply held religious beliefs. Yeah. And these were women who were, they needed to complete their miscarriage. The fetus was dead and they would go to a pharmacy and they still couldn't get the, the pills to complete the complete it and stuff. And so um, I uh, commonly debate on Facebook, a someone who's the head of the pro-life uh, movement in, in a certain county in Ohio. And uh, there is nothing, nothing you can tell this guy that, um, that will change him that pro-life is everything that means to him. And you know, when he's when he says, um, well, there are exceptions to the law, that are built into in Ohio and some of these other states. But, um, you know, the last time I checked, the United States had 70% of the world's attorneys and they're hungry. And so you can't blame the physicians and the mid-level providers for saying, we're not going to be a test case uh, for these uh, laws. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think about 20 years ago, Ty, you may remember this, but there was um, a Catholic, large Catholic hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, St. Joseph's, and, uh, and somebody uh, presented there um, miscarrying, and um, uh, the, the physicians and the administrators had to make a choice uh, that this was not a viable pregnancy, and they, they felt they had to save the life of the mother from complications. And so, so um, the administrator went over the head of the board, the Catholic board, and said that no, we need to we need to complete the abortion, which the body is doing, anyway, um, uh, which they did, and, and she was subsequently fired because they she interfered with the fetal um, growth, and that, and I know that there's been some lawsuits against Catholic hospitals in mm -hmm. the United States the last 20 years where women have been uh, turned away at the emergency room who were bleeding because the fetus wasn't dead yet, and so. Yes. Um, uh, a huge portion, I think, Ty, you may know, I don't know, I think it's like 60% of the healthcare uh, hospitals in the United States are now Catholic run. And so um, talk about oh, separation. In the separation of church and state, it's separation of church and healthcare system, which has now been unfortunately compromised in the United States. Mm. Yeah, well, there is a Center for Reproductive Justice that's filed a legal action on behalf of these poor women and the leader, the president of that center, says it is now dangerous to be pregnant in Texas. Wow. Unfortunately, not not just Texas, but in a lot of states. And yeah, I think yeah. There's 13 to 11 so far, and and there's a bunch of these trigger laws which are now on hold. And so, wow. if they get if they start to get passed, um, then they'll then it's going to end up 
almost 50 50 you know it's going to end up like 45 versus 55 states or excuse me 45 versus um uh 35 or whatever that uh where the the us is that's just going to be another polarization split about half the states will be um will have that available to women and half um if you're pregnant and something's going wrong good luck yeah well uh, it's not for me to pontificate and tell the americans how to run their country but over here we make laws in parliament where it's not an emotive crisis at that time but in the states you make laws mostly in court cases where it's very divisive which way the decision goes well the supreme court basically said hey it's states rights now which is what they've been after forever and so um you know hopefully it's a cycle i don't know if it'll go back during my generation or it's now that i'm older but um yeah. you know it'd be nice to live long enough to see this turn around the other way with the next yeah. generation coming up and and but they're packing the supreme court with young people that are going to yeah. be around for 50 years mm. and um and then they've got a hold of the state legislatures in the conservative uh, south mm. and west and so um yeah it's I'm, I'm afraid i'm not gonna be able to see it turn back the other way if it if it ever mm. does that no probably not takes 30 well years. it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be packed with conservatives, though. It could be it could be packed with progressives because Joe Biden is the president right now. He's not a progressive, but if he were, he could pack the courts. You know. Well, you'd have to you'd have to extend the number on the, yeah. the Supreme Court. Correct. That's the easy way. And so yeah. you know, and they're looking at that uh, possibly. But it, it's too bad that uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't retire. She thought she was going to make it. You know, and that was a really a bad decision on her part not to step down while there was still the chance to put somebody else in. Yeah, but. yeah. yeah. It's almost yeah. the power is really hard to give up, and we give too much of it to like nine people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so somewhere nearer to you, Ty. Hey, Nash Nashville, okay. Nashville. I don't know. I'm, I I ought to give up trying my American accent, really, shouldn't I? In <laughs> that wasn't even close. Ah, so just minor correction, John <laughs> Peters. So I am a doctor, but my it's a PhD in biochemistry and chemical engineering. Oh, so okay, I'm, okay. So you're yeah. So you're one of the uh, true doctorates. I didn't. Know <laughs> we can we can also talk sometime, Ty, about how the MD PhD in medical school is no way close to how a real PhD thinks. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think. Yeah. I, I have you a, are right in that it, it is a bubble, like the societies yeah. that you're in, because once yeah. you get out of the academic environment and you realize... Yeah. Do you know, I'm glad you said that, John, because well, the pub, more of the public need to know that for medical doctors, it's a courtesy title. It's not an earned qualification. Well, no, I, we can talk about that, but um, I have a master's degree in biology in, in basic sciences, so um, I was kind of watching the MD, PhD uh, program unfold at my medical school, which which is a very good one. But but, you know, they they pull the the um, those candidates after the second year. And instead of going to the hospital and finishing their clinical years, they go into a lab and learn how to be a Ph.D. But it's like. I think it's it's basically for industry, and my impression is is that there are, you know, MDs don't generally think like PhDs. They're more into fixing things and not after why this is happening so much. And so, you know, if it takes if it takes um, four to six years to get a PhD on a regular scientific track, and then you can get a PhD in medical school in two years, three years, you really it's not the same. And, and yeah. that's why I appreciate, for example, Francis Collins in that his MD yeah. and his PhD are separate, but anyway, yeah. we can, we could talk yeah, about that because I'm, I'm, I'm more, I was basically a biologist that went to medical school. Yeah. So, yeah. That, that's another show, isn't it? It that's is. A, it could I, be. Yeah. I wasn't. And so was Francis Collins. Yes. I have well, a, on my website, I just completed a blog on why theistic evolution is untenable. So, um, yeah, yeah, we can talk about that sometime, too. And him, indeed, yeah. I wasn't targeting you. I know you're an exception, but I see your point, because the medical um, 
higher qualifications are more about engineering than investigating. Yeah. At, at least the students are. I, but I was I went to a medical school that was very, very much into evolution stuff. And, and I was actually shocked that of, of all the biochemistry teachers, they were some of the strongest uh, advocates for evolution that I had seen even in my in my biology program. And so that was kind of a surprise to me. Um, but it was a pleasantly, um, you know, experienced. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. So. Getting back to Nyishville, um, Tennessee. What is it? Well, what are these accents? Go ahead. <laughs> there's, there's a pastor, Kent Christmas. <laughs> and is that his real then, name? It, well, <laughs> is, is he a real pastor? <laughs> That's, yeah. Anyway, his church is Regeneration, Nyishville. And um, he's urged his congregation to avoid putting their money in banks and give it to the church. Oh. <laughs> That's it's great. A, it's a so, spiritual investment. In in Nashville, in Tennessee, there's a um, there's a funny stereotype of people who don't put their money in banks. They bury their money. And uh, the idea is I don't want the government to do anything about my money. I don't want them to track it. And I don't want them to know how much I have. And I don't believe in currency as like this electronic thing that I can put on a card and all that stuff. Yeah. It could be going away any second. But honestly, it's for I like to buy illicit things and I don't want uh, to be tracked in any degree. And if I ever get arrested, I want to know where all my money is. That way I can run to like yes. my stashes and get them and move on. Yeah, yeah. And so like so, a pastor with that same mindset is hilarious. It's funny. Yeah, well, he's slightly got a different idea because he's effectively saying, give it to me. Here he is. Right. Watch this. <laughs> I will this put it in. I, this is my personal opinion. I don't think churches should ever have to lean on banking systems to finance the kingdom of God. Christians deposit their money in the wrong places. We're putting it in banks. Any company that does not believe in God, that backs up abortion, backs up homosexuality, that backs up anything that stands against Christianity, has a curse on it. When you invest your money in companies that exclude God, you are planting in bad soil. So it doesn't make any sense. But if you got extra money, plant it in the kingdom of the Lord. Do it in missions. Do it in places. Listen, right now, we are good soil. If you got a million, give it. And God will give you back to me. You say, well, that's easy to say. I'm just telling you, you cannot outgive God. And this is an opportunity for you, for God to open the windows of heaven over you. Give Give him your seed and he will give you your harvest. That's the prosperity gospel. Yes, yes. yes. You know, I'm reminded of a great George Carlin skit where he talks about how God is all powerful, all knowing, all everything. He's just not good with money. He needs money. Yes, he can't do money. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, this prosperity gospel really does work for one person. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, more power to it. Look, get your money, dude. You know, if you can con a bunch of people into giving you money, people who believe in magic, hey, dude, yeah. it's like street magicians. They get paid, right? So why shouldn't preachers? It's the same thing. You know, my my wife my wife grew up on a farm, and so you know they actually had to kill some of the animals for food and stuff. I mean, it was that. And she said, out of all the animals on the farm, the sheep are the dumbest. Shit, it's there, you know, and so the fact that the the um, the, the followers of Christ are called sheep and the shepherd, yep. um, she said, the, the the sheep are really stupid. I got I got two things to say. One, magicians call them tricks for a reason, and yeah. so that's how I let them get away with it. Whereas the church uses it not only as a I'm actually telling you the truth, but also gay people are bad. Uh, women deserve to be second-class citizens in their own yeah. home. Uh, these are the chosen people. These are not the chosen people. These deserve to be punished. These people don't deserve to be. There's a lot more baggage that comes with it that I just find the whole system toxic. And second, Absolutely. sheep can learn how to 
recognize their name. Listen, John Peters, I I can post a YouTube video that will blow your mind. You know those dog dances they do with like border collies or whatever, like where they go between the people's legs and music? They yeah. train sheep to do the same thing too. It's just a question of effort. And I think no one goes to the effort to train a sheep because they just want the sheep for what it can give them and, mm. and, and nothing for what the sheep can offer on a uh, as a friendship uh, pet sort of a thing. But like if you ever train a sheep, you can train a sheep. There's videos of people doing it. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe they're not as dumb as we think. And maybe it's easier to kill an animal and, and, and slaughter it if you think they're stupid to begin with. Right. Yeah. Then if you realize, I, oh, I don't know. She's got. She lived with them. So I, you know, I. Dude, do. I got pics of me sh shearing sheep right now. Do we? I mean, I live in Tennessee. Do we really got to do this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got a landing event coming up this week. Like, uh, yeah, sheep are awesome. Like, let's not besmirch the great name of sheep. They're really awesome. Yeah, we have. We have lambing events here, and you can take the kids to see the new baby, the little lambikins. You know. So cute. So by the way, you may. By the way, uh, Ty, I think everyone who lives in the Midwest and the South should get an award uh, from the weather, the mosquitoes, and the tornadoes, and everything else. But also, if you're an atheist, um, definitely, definitely need some sort of award that um, that you're living in that culture. I don't, I don't know if I could do it. So, well, I would, but I would probably be strung up on the tree outside. Hey, I'm wearing the same shirt. This is from this same weekend. I did this yesterday. This is like, this is natural. This is normal. Yeah. Sheep are awesome. And they're, they're really easy to tackle too. Because and, got and, to, and, to it, and to prove it, you're wearing one. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you guys may or may not know that there was a shooting. It's very rare in Hamburg in Germany. Mm. It's very difficult to get a gun in, in Europe. But it did happen. Seven people were killed and several more injured. And the shooting was at a Jehovah's Witness meeting hall. Police say the gunman acted alone and is thought to be dead. And more recently, a day later, it was revealed that the gunman had been a member of that Jehovah's Witness meeting place. Of course he was. But he, yeah. but he left, left that branch of the Jehovah's Witnesses on bad terms you know you know they're very strong on shunning aren't they so yeah he was probably disfellowshipped and the trauma Ooh. that that caused i could very easily yeah. i i did i was not familiar with that story as you were reading it john but i already knew the conclusion of it as you as soon as you said there was a shooting at a jehovah's yes. witness kingdom hall i knew mm -hmm. who the shooter was and i knew what yes. the motive was yes yes because there's you no other reason there's no other reason to explain that you know <laughs> That's right. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to work that out, do you? No. Guys, you've been wonderful. Thank you very much. It's time for me to let you go so that you can enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I hope you can come back next week because I've thoroughly enjoyed this. I don't know about you, but uh, it's been good for me. <laughs> Thank you. Me Say bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Several uh, clergy was the Pope, was the Pope appealing for peace or was he praying for peace? Um, and, and the same applies to the Caribbean Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you, what do you have to say about that?